Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. We're going to open with the song, God So Loved. So if you all stand with all of them. <coughs> So 
Those are smelling good. Listen, this morning, I, I just wanted to talk to us a little bit about what's going on around and just a couple of announcements. Uh, the reason why I'm up here is because what we want to do is we're going to start to try and keep the uh, video on the stage so that those who are sitting in the second and third row don't get caught on the video because I've already heard that there's a few people who are very nervous about having it on the back of their head and being seen on the video. So, um, so here it is. And the last two rows, heads up, the last two rows are going to be reserved for those who are a little behind. <laughs> All right? So, no, it's, it's, this is serious because what happens is when a new person comes in, and I, I told you this once before, when a new person comes in and they've never been to church, you've been there, I've been there, and they come in, where do they sit? If we've decided that we're going to sit at the back, I'm just as guilty because when I'm not preaching, I like to sit as far back as I can. But you know what? Let's just take this and say, guys, it's about somebody else. You know what? It's not about, we're not selfish. I'm trying to say, we're, we're, it's not about selfishness. We're, we're, we, we get caught and we just think, you know, I, I just don't want to sit at the back. Now, there are some that have to sit at the back because Kelly is, is working and, and she's, making sure she's engaging with everybody online. By the way, welcome those who are online watching live. We're glad you joined us and those who are going to be watching through the week. I'm glad you're watching. There's about 166 people who view the service, uh, whether it's through the week. There's a, there's a number that comes through, the, through today, but uh, there's up to 166 people who will view the service through the week. And so you know what? God is at work and God is touching people's hearts. Amen. And so this is what, the whole purpose is to see God move. So anyways, that's kind of just a, a little bit of a, a reasoning why we want to keep those back rows open so people can come and uh, see what's going on. Uh, two things. Next week, for those of you who are on sound, who are on PowerPoint, who are on worship, any part of the worship with musical instruments or, or just singing, we have a jam session. We're going to call it PB&J. No, I'm just joking. Uh, uh, PB&J, peanut butter and j No, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to call it, it, it's a jam session where we're going to come and we're just going to work on our skills and work to, to uh, build and to become better. Because you know what? It's not about being perfect. But we want, to, we want to do the best that we can for the Lord. Um, so that's what's going to happen on the 15th. Now, this next weekend, bring your own lunch. No, P, no PB&J for you. You bring your own PB&J. Um, so then uh, this weekend coming up, we are going to do that uh, downstairs in the storage room. And already today, we have gotten a number of volunteers to clean it out because once that's cleaned out, then when the new shelves get put in, we can just take it down, and then we're going to need help on Saturday night. Not Saturday night to put everything back in? Well, as long as we can get the, we, once we get the, the shelves in, then we need to get the people to do it. So we're going to have to be aware of who can volunteer. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to get some numbers because I don't know exactly what time these no, no shelves are going to be here. We're going to be putting them together Friday night out at Doug's, and we're going to build them there. And then Saturday, uh, if, the, if they're all together, then we'll bring them in and we'll get them down here. But then we need everything brought in from the Sunday school back into there so that there's room downstairs, okay? So we're going to need some people to be prepared to be through this week to be called and said, this is the time we're doing it, and that's what we're doing, all right? Um, another thing that's coming up, and I'm doing this a little, a little bit ahead of time. It's in January we're going to start, and in January it's called Life to Life. 
and it's learning to live as a witness for Jesus in everyday encounters. You know, we all want to learn, and we all want to know, how, how can I be a witness? And is it about knocking on doors? No. Is it about going up and down Main Street talking with people? No, it can be. But it's how do we learn to live to be a witness in our everyday encounters with people? And if you're interested to do that, uh, I've got to order the books for you. And so if you want to join, then I'm going to ask that you let me know so I can get these books. They're $15 a piece, American. I've already bought five of them. So uh, if you want one, then you need to let me know. It's really important. I'm excited about it. I've already gone through the book and did all the looking and got involved with that. Yeah. Uh, that can be. Uh, it's it's going to be here at the church. Uh, probably, I've got to work on the date, probably on a Sunday or something like that, just a Sunday night, just so that people are able to, to be there. Uh, but if you're interested, we've got to work out the dates. All right? Now, this, did you, did you guys smell the cinnamon buns? Now, and I'm looking at this, they're really, they're actually really good. Uh, Grandma Al has, uh, wants to help and serve in the church. And one of the things that she can do is make cinnamon buns. Now, how many would like a cinnamon bun? Okay, it's, uh, if you want a cinnamon bun, uh, donations can be made to the church. Um, because Grandma Al wants to serve in this way is that uh, she's not selling them, she's donating them. And she's asking that you would do put a donation to the church to help pay for some of the things that are coming up, much like the photocopier or whatever. And she's saying, let the leadership decide. But uh, those donations need to get uh, acknowledged and put into the offering place or, or given to somebody. I, we're going to figure, we've got to figure out where you're going to put it. But if you're going to put it in the back, make sure you write on there, donation, and um, then we can put that, the finances where they belong, all right? So I'll set that there, behind there, so only I can see it. <laughs> now, um, prayer, we're, we've got, uh, every week we pray for a church. And this week we want to be praying for the Covenant Christian Reformed Church. We don't get a chance to hear too much from them, but what we want to do is we believe that, that we're in this together, serving God together. Every church is a lighthouse. And so we're going to pray for the Covenant Christian Reformed Church today uh, and ask that God would just bless them as they serve in what they're doing, but also in their Christmas, because Christmas is coming. I don't know if you know that, but it's coming. And we just want to pray that God would just equip them as well. Um, and this morning, too, I, was on, I just want to talk to you a little bit about worship. Worship is an important part. Just like prayer is so important in our church, Worship is also something very, very important. Because worship, and, and let, let me tell me this, I'm going to do this real quick because Amy has something she wants to say. Um, but worship is so important because what it does is it comes out of a heart that first of all it has to give out of uh, a willingness. If you want to worship, it has to start from a willing heart. Amen? It's got to start from a willingness and a grateful heart. And so when we come to worship, it's a place where we acknowledge God for who He is. We, we look to see God, and, and as we worship God, in, and it can happen in singing, or it can happen in our giving, or it can happen in our everyday walk. But worship is that free giving of God, the, cre the, the credence, credence, credits, the words that will acknowledge, him for who he is you know you get you, you try you, the word was there and then all of a sudden poof it was gone but you know what it's that freedom of acknowledging God for who he is and when we start to sing even this one I'm walking in freedom you know freedom comes because Jesus paid the price for us and we have to acknowledge God God thank you for this freedom that we have so worship in song is comes out of a heart freely given. And again, worship comes when we walk day by day in prayer. When we turn and acknowledge God, God, you are 
the, my God, you are the only one that I serve. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. There is no other. And when we start to acknowledge God for who he is, what ends up happening is everything else has to come down because God is God. Let me give you some scripture verses. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks. You speak to one another, telling each other this is what, who God is, and encouraging one another. Keep looking to Jesus. He's going to give you the strength. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Your bodies, everything you do, is about worship to God, acknowledging God. And then in Proverbs 3, honor the Lord with your possessions, your giving of your finances in the act of worship, because you are acknowledging God who is your source. You acknowledge God as you give freely out of your resources, out of what you have. You give, and you do that out of worship. By the way, God does not, God loves a cheerful giver. And if you give out of, oh, I just have to, God can't bless that. God blesses when you give and you acknowledge Him for who He is. It's freely, willingly, and giving unto God. So there you are. Worship. Proverbs, or Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. What does it say? To, what does that mean to rejoice? It means to give, be joyful about who God is. Rejoice in the Lord always, and in everything give thanks. So I'm going to pass this over to Amy, and she's going to share a little bit about OCC. Thank you, my dear. Morning, everyone. Um, we have a DVD that's coming up. But while we wait for that, um, just a reminder, it's almost time for shoe boxes to come in. So us as a church here, if we could have your boxes in by next Sunday, the reason we do that is so we can pray over our boxes before all the rest of them come into our church and then we pray over all of them again. Now, the reason, oh, we have the thing, we'll just give that a minute. Um, the reason I say to pray so much over these boxes is the stories that we hear back from um, the de deliverance of these boxes are just so amazing that God could take a box that somebody, you know, in a remote community like Rocky, and it travels across the world, and it just gets into the hands of the right child. When um, Trevor and I were in Uruguay delivering boxes a number of years ago, we heard a story of a shoebox that got opened by a little boy. He was in the five to nine year age range, and in his box was deodorant. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think about putting deodorant in a box for a five to nine-year-old. For the 10 to 14, yeah. But this boy had the box with deodorant in, and he was so excited, and the person goes, you know, what's the big deal? It's deodorant, you're five to nine. But what they didn't know is this little boy had been praying for deodorant. His father was in jail and needed deodorant. So this little boy began to pray. And because of this deodorant, it affected the whole prison. Now another thing, there was a box that came in um, and it was full of socks. Now in Calgary, they have to go through every box to make sure there's nothing that um, customs will stop a, a shipment if there's something in that can't go through customs. So they looked at this box and in it was socks, just socks. And they go, what do we do? Do we add more stuff? Do we take out some socks? But they really believe in leaving the boxes as much intact as they can. So the box got delivered as, what, as it was and it got into the hands of a child who had a foot problem and he had to wear clean socks every single day. So, you know, these kind of stories that just show the impact of a shoebox, the impact of praying for the shoebox. So, yeah. that saying, if you guys could get your shoeboxes here by next Sunday, that would be great for the rest of you. Um, the following week, if you get them in, that's the official collection date. And get your boxes here Thursday to Saturday. The church will be opened um, from November 19th to the 21st. And then, um, oh, also, if you're packing boxes online, just remember to get those <coughs> packed. And, well, you don't pack them. You just go online and you can pack them 
distance-wise yeah. or whatever. But go and get your boxes packed if it's online. Um, now we'll just show this video a minute. We're here in the middle of Puerto Santa Ana in Ecuador, close to the Amazon. Kids are receiving the shoebox for the very first time in their lives. Gracias por empacar las cajitas de regalo. Gracias por orar por estos niños. When I was 10 years old, I received an Operation Christmas Child shoebox in my hometown, Ambato, Ecuador. I remember my favorite thing in that box, it was like this black jacket, super cool, that I was wearing until I turned 16, I think. <laughs> I understand when I received the shoebox that God was taking care of me in a particular way. He was putting his eyes on me. When I understood that, I just felt that I needed to give something back. So after I, I received my shoebox, I, I decided that I want to do something, but I was not a, a, a preacher back those days. I was Stan. <laughs> so the, the easy way was become a clown. <laughs> so I was a clown. I used to do a lot of puppets and those kind of stuff, uh, trying to just turn the gospel with the shoeboxes and all those things. When you understand that God could call anyone, but he decided to call you, <laughs> It makes me feel like I need to do my greatest and just put all my energy as the people that were part of the party that I was in when I was 10. I want to be the same thing now. <laughs> I want to give my all my energy because you never know who around all of those children are becoming pastors, are becoming servants. We're not just giving gifts to the children. We are opening doors for them to understand that God has an entire life for them. God has a plan with every single children that is receiving this shoebox. Today I have the privilege to be the senior pastor in the Hechos 29 Church in Ambato, Ecuador. This simple shoebox gave me the chance to see my great father loves for me. And now that's the reason that all Sunday mornings I'm so excited to, to go to the church and share the gospel and, and, and preach. It gave me the chance to see that there are many people just like me that are in need maybe just of a hack or just to hurt them, Jesus loved them. And now I'm able to do that because someone just heard God's voice and put a black jacket on my shoebox. Man, it's just so crazy that people are just so willing to give something from themselves. But that is God. It's God working through people for other people. And for the ones that are packing shoeboxes, man, thank you very much. You are doing a huge, huge work just hearing God's voice. Wow. I'm not sure about you guys, but I almost had a tear. Hmm. Which almost? is amazing for me, because I try to hide those things. So if you'll stand with us, we're going to continue to worship. Thank you, Lord. Kingdom, the light that shines over everyone. We look to you, we long for you, O oh Lord. We behold the rising sun, the earth awakes, 
Your hope has come. We look to you. We long for you, O oh Lord. Oh. I was reading the Bible this week, and um, <coughs> I kept getting wake, woken up by scriptures. Um, basically, they're all from the Psalms, and as the one that stuck out the most, and just I tried to go back to sleep, and it would not let me go back to sleep. Was I will bless the Lord at all times; His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in Thee, Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. 
O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. And let's just magnify and bless the Lord together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up.
upon the praises of a thousand generations. You are worthy, Lord of all. Unto you, the slain and risen King, we lift our voice with heaven, singing worthy, Lord of all, Lord of all. Father God, thank you that where two or three are gathered, you are there in our midst. Thank you for being here with us. Continue to go with us throughout the service. In Jesus' name. Well, before we get started too far, we're going to pray uh, for the kids as they're going to go to Sunday school, and we're going to pray also uh, for the CRC this morning. So let's just, let's just join together in prayer. Father, we just thank you so much for your presence. Lord, you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of all our praise. You are worthy of it all. And we exalt you. We exalt you. Father, this morning, we've, we've come to a place where we acknowledge you. And even now, Lord, we choose to open our ears to hear and allow your spirit, Lord, to change and transform our lives. Father, this morning, uh, we just pray for the, the Sunday school. I pray, God, that you would just uh, be with these kids as they go down, that, Lord, that they might experience and know you better, that they might grow in you. And I pray, Lord, your blessing on uh, Amy, Amy as she goes and she leads this and, and those that are serving and helping her. Lord, let that uh, impact their lives. And Father, as we want to pray also for the Covenant Christian Reformed Church, and we pray, Lord, your blessing over that church. We pray, Lord, for your hand over that pastor as he stands to before the, the people today, that, Lord, he might be encouraged. That, Lord, that uh, words that, have, that would seem to be discouraging would, would ch be changed and that he might be encouraged and grow in you. And, Lord, this blessed. Let that word penetrate the hearts. Lord, and as they move into this Christmas season, Lord, as they desire to reach and touch people, that, God, that they, you would guide them in their efforts. Lord, bless them today and all the other churches. And, Lord, we just give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, so we're going to let the kids go to Sunday school. Uh, we are going to continue with our uh, series this morning uh, where it talks about be calm, keep calm, and put on the whole armor of God. Uh, this, we're, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to be reading. Um, but before, before I read Ephesians chapter 6, I'd just like to... Uh, talk to you a little bit about another story in the Bible, and this is this kind of give you an idea where we're going, because we've talked about already, we've talked about the truth like a belt. You know, we're called to put on truth. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? What is truth? That, that comes, and then Pilate says, when Jesus stood before him and Jesus said that he came to testify to the truth, and Pilate says, what is truth? Do you know that truth is so important because if you do not know the truth, if you don't stand on what you believe, then everything else, truth like a belt, brings everything and holds it all together. We talked about righteousness like a breastplate. Not just, not just the fact that I've, I've been made righteous because God has made me righteous, but I walk righteously. I walk in a way that is in right standing. I walk in this way that represents what God has already done in my life. We have righteousness like a breastplate. And then we talked about shoes, and, and I had fun with that one because I was a shoe salesman. And I have fun playing with... I, 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 did a lot with shoes. I, I had so much fun in that, that, uh, that uh, 
occupation because I talked with so many people and I served and I got to hear stories. But the thing about shoes is that if your shoes are not done properly, if they're not set on your feet, you can quickly slip and slide and you can, you can twist your ankle, you can fall and, and, and it doesn't hold you when you're running across the, 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 um, the rocks. When I was younger, we used to run up and down our driveway. I, I lived out in the farm and you used to start to run on the gravel road and your feet got calloused very well. And all the city slickers, they couldn't run, so you, you, you had a full, a full, full uh, opportunity to beat them wherever you're at. But you see, we need to have shoes, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Do you know what your salvation, that gospel, that you have peace with God? Because that's going to keep you in good standing. And so we've already talked about three. But this morning is important. You see, and I'm going to tell you the story back in Mark chapter 4. You stay in Ephesians, but I'm going to tell you the story. Jesus tells the disciples, guys, we've just fed the 5,000. I got rid of that. They're, they're done. And we're going across the lake. Jesus was tired, and, and he fell asleep on the, on, the, on the boat. As they were going, a storm rose up. A storm rose up, and, and it started to go. The, the water was coming into the boat. And the disciples, even though they were well-groomed and they knew fishing, they knew the sea, they were afraid because the storm was so great. And there was Jesus sleeping. And they went to Jesus and they woke him up. And they just kind of said, you know, Jesus, it's kind of cool that you get to sleep. So, you know, just have a good rest and, and we're, we'll, we'll deal with this. Is that what they did? Come on. What did they do? They, they were fearful. What else? We're all going to die. Come on, I'm going to say this a little bit because I know it's going to go really loud, but we're dying! Jesus, we're dying! Wake up! I want to talk to you about the storms in your life that you're going through right now. And I'm telling you, this week, for some people, and I know, and it hit me, there's a storm starting to rise, and we feel like we're going to die. Can I get a witness? Has anybody been there? Come on. It may not have been this week, but have you been at that place? I'm going to die. That storm is going on. And Jesus got up. And he said, peace be still. One word from Jesus settled the storm. But he said to them in a really interesting way, he said this, you have little faith. Guys, we're going to talk about faith like a shield. We need to take up faith like a shield this morning. When the storms and the struggles of life come crashing in and you need to hang on, you need to settle that, 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 that shield and you take bunker in. And we're going to talk a little bit more because there's faith in so many different areas. There's faith to move mountains. You know, we can have faith and we can believe God that the, you can just speak to the mountain and cast it into the sea and it's gone. There's a type of faith. There's other faith when we pray, believing. We're going to pray and believe together. But there's a faith that we need to carry through the storms. You see, the armor was really meant for us to help us to stand. The armor was to stand, not to move forward. And when storms come, we need to know how to stand with faith. So you ready? Are you ready to go through this journey with me this morning? Ephesians chapter 6. 
starting at verse 10. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers of darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared and having prepared everything to take your stand, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. For all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. This morning, again, we've, we're starting to walk through, and, and there's many people, we talk about, oh yeah, I, I know we're in a warfare. And I can, I can look out and I can say, oh yeah, you all know you're in a warfare. But so often what ends up happening is, is you and I, when the warfare is hitting, we don't think about it, and we start to do it in our own strength, to fight it in our own strength. We don't pay attention and realize that the things that are coming against us is an attack and a work of the enemy to distract and to, to dissuade, to push us away from following and doing what God has for us to do. And I want to remind you today that you're in a warfare. And when you start to move forward in God, I'll tell you, the enemy is not just going to sit back and say, oh, well, that's all. He's going to fight back. And I, there is a book that was, was uh, talked about in this book. It, he, he was, it's called The Garden. And this fellow who wrote it started to speak about the battle that's raging in our souls. And if we want to, be, if we want to win the battle against the stress and anxiety all those things that would seem like it's attacking us that want to make us cry out, we're all going to die. If we want to do this, we have to understand what it is and to carry that shield of faith. And he gives five Ds, and I'm just going to quickly give them to you. Oh, I better. I knew we had this. There's five Ds. It's not up here, but I, hopefully I, you can write them down. There are five Ds that will the enemy will use against us. And I, I would suggest that these are the fiery arrows that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6. Are you ready for them? Number one, doubt. If the enemy could get you to doubt God's love, if he could get you to doubt what's going on, that's why the truth like a belt is so important. If he can get you to doubt it, he's got you. The other arrow, distortion. If he can distort the truth. You know, Satan is really likes to take a little bit of truth or, or take a lie and throw in a little bit of truth. He can just distort it a little bit. And you know, what I found this week is a person can say one thing and out of their mouth is not, but it, the devil will take it and twist it and you hear it completely different. And he will distort truth. And what's believed the lie believed, he, what will end up happening is he's again, he gets you to throw away your shield. The third one is discouragement. An arrow of discouragement, if you can get it put in, you can you just start to shrink down. How many have been discouraged before? 
Yeah. Everybody has faced discouragement. The fourth one he get, gives is distraction. Get you distracted from what you're supposed to be doing and get you going. Like I, I do rabbit trails, and sometimes those rabbit trails are fun, but we can get distracted from what's the, the main point. And I want to tell you, be aware of the distractions that will come up. Because Satan can get you to go someplace else or get do, getting doing something really nice but distracted you from what is important. Another one is division. To divide people. Division is two visions. And it's this, this, this is the vision, but Satan comes in and says, oh, but you should be doing this. Or, or Then there's two visions, a division. And he divides us. I think this, or I think this, or I think that. You know what? We need to come back and stay focused. Satan will divide people. And he divides people by what he says. And if they can believe, because he's the accuser of the brethren, right? He accuses me to God. God, did you see what Trevor did this week? Did you see how his, his actions were? Do you see his heart? He's useless. And he'll accuse me before God. God says, that's my son. And my blood covered that. You see, he accuses us to God, but he also accuses God to us. God doesn't love you. God doesn't love you. You're too old to be loved. You're useless. You're done. God doesn't want to use you no more. You're too young. You're too young to sing up front. How dare you even think you can? You hear me? And so the person feels like they, oh, I'm too young, I can't do it, so I quit. He accuses God and says, God doesn't love you, he doesn't want you doing that. Or accuses us to one another. And he gets us to start to look at each other's faults rather than what God's done. So he's an accuser. So these, these arrows come in and they, they can penetrate. But I want to I, I get off topic, and, and again, that was a, a little bit the wrong direction. I, we'll get into that la later on, but we want to, I want to just bring to you and talk to you about, first of all, the Roman shield. What was the Roman shield all about? We're going to talk about the Christian's shield and how to take up the shield, okay? So the very first part is, what is the Roman shield? The Roman shield, there's actually two times a of shields that they had. One was the small one. And it was easily picked up and, and it was just a small round one or something, could sometimes a square, but it was easily to maneuver. And what that was was the hand-to-hand -hand combat for when they were coming and it's close and there is, you could move it quickly to defend yourself. But then there's another one. It was a much bigger one. Sometimes it was, made, it was made out of wood but wrapped with leather. And this shield was big enough that when it was planted in front of the soldier, because it was the first line of defense, that shield would be planted down in front. And at the time, it would be called, and they referred to this shield as the door. So when this door was put in place, the first set of defense, the soldier would come and they would hide behind it because these arrows were being shot. You see, the devil really likes to use arrows because these arrows can fly and you don't see them sometimes. And they come and they land. He doesn't have to be right in front of you with his red suit and his, you know, and his pitchfork. He doesn't have to be there. He can shoot them from a distance and you don't recognize them until they get you. 
And this, this shield was there, and the darts would come. And, and the darts themselves, and I, I might go be a little bit ahead of myself, but these darts, they would, what they would do is they would light their, their um, arrows on fire. And then they'd stretch, and then they'd shoot them. And all you see is these, have you ever watched those movies where you see all the arrows coming in? I love those. Like it's, and then they attack and everything. It's all the fighting. But anyways, the arrows are coming in. And they're landing, and they're getting past the, the, the soldier's shields. And it's hitting them and killing them. Or it's mortally wounding them. So this is what they would do is they'd light them and these, these arrows would come, these shields would be there and what they would do is they would soak them before they went into battle. They'd soak them in water and so they would be much heavier. But then they're there and when, this, when the arrow hits, guess what? The water extinguishes the arrow. Interesting enough is at that time they would also take and they'd have hollow tips and they would imp they'd put stuff in there that went, once it hit the, the, um, the shield, it would explode. It wasn't gunpowder. I don't know what it was. It's just I'm trying to, I, I tried to look it up and I couldn't find it. But, but this is what they, would, they were saying, is that it would hit the shield, it would explode and set everything on fire. So here's the question. Why would that be a, such a big deal? Why would these arrows hitting the shield be such a big deal? Let me tell you. Because if the shield was on fire, what is the first thing you do when something's on fire in front of you? Whew, get rid of it. Oh, now what? You are wide open, buddy. You are wide open. So is the shield important? Yeah. It's very important. So it was the first line of defense. And they were large enough so that they could hide behind. Another thing about the, this um, shield, it was the shield was beveled around on the inside. So guess what? When they were going to move forward, they would hook their shields together and make a wall. And they could protect themselves and others around them. I'm going to just skip right ahead real quick here. You know what? We've all gone through a storm. Or maybe you're going through a storm right now. You need to make sure you grab that shield. And you need to plant it. But you need those around us, the body of Christ, to hook shields and start to protect. And how do we do this? We pray one for another. We encourage one another. We don't discourage. We don't speak against, but we encourage and pray and we build one another up. You see, when, the, when this wall is there and when the door is there, you've got to get through the door to get to the soldier. And if the soldier's already discouraged and dropped down, we place it so that they are not continually destroyed. This Christian, this Christian shield the Christian shield is called what? Faith. Faith like a shield. Faith is, and I've told you this before, faith is a conviction, it is a confidence, and it's a commitment. And it cannot be just sitting there. It has to be applied to someone or something. You could have your faith in yourself. Probably not the best, but you can. You can have faith in someone else. You can have faith in your job. You can have faith in... But the point is, a Christian, we're called to have faith in God. Have faith in God because He is the all-powerful one. He is the one who can carry us through. He is the one that we need to hold on to. Again, we talked about faith in prayer or faith to move mountains. But it's faith to stand in times of struggle and storm that we grab a hold of that shield of faith that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6. 
Now remember I told you that this larger shield was referred to as the door. I want to ask you a question, and maybe, maybe some of you are great scholars and remember what John 10 says. But let me remind you. John 10 and verse 7. You know, John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. But John 10, verse 7, Jesus said to them, he said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will be able to go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the door of the sheep. When we put our faith in Jesus, guess what? The enemy has to get through Jesus to get to you. And so often what we end up doing is we end up taking that shield or we, we, well, let's use the analogy of the door. And we are always, we, we enter into struggles, we enter into temptation, and we see and the enemy comes and he wants to tempt us or, or throw discouragement at us. And we just open the door and we get hit. And we figure, man, if I, if, if I only knew that I just put Jesus there. So let Jesus answer the door. And then that deals with it. We need to allow Jesus to be the door of our lives so that we don't keep going into this. When discouragement comes, and you know what? Discouragement does come. But we have to recognize that my, re- my fighting is not against flesh and blood. I don't battle against people. Our fighting is against principalities and powers. Satan is going to use whatever arrows he can to hit you and to destroy you. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. God told Abram that he would be his shield. God will protect Abram as Abram places faith in God. Abram decided, God spoke to Abram and said, I want you to go to this land. I want you to pack up and just go. I'm not going to tell you where you're going. Just start going. Abram believed God and he went. We find the same idea throughout the entire Old Testament. The idea is found at least 20 times in the book of Psalms alone. Over and over again, it speaks about God in whom we place our trust. It talks about, it it describes as our shield, uh, he is described as our shield and fortress, the one who protects us from our enemies. In Psalms 91 and verse 4, it says, God's faithfulness itself is described as a shield. God is faithful and when we know and we stand firm on the fact that God is faithful, it, can, it becomes a shield for us. Psalm 76, verse 3, we read that God breaks the arrows of the enemies. An arrow of discouragement. An arrow, and, and there's another one of distrust. There's so many, th- these arrows come in. He breaks those. In Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5, we read that God is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. So when it comes to Ephesians 6 and 16, where it talks about these these, these arrows, Paul intends that faith is to be used by the Christian in spiritual warfare. Not just faith in ourselves or faith in our faith, but faith in God. When we're starting to go through it, God, I trust you. I believe in you. I know that you are with me and that nothing can can come against me because, Father, you are with me and I stand firm in you. You see, we can become discouraged. We can be offended. But we need to go back to God and put our trust in God. We're going to give you a few examples of some people who stood in faith in God. Again, these fiery darts. That's faith, fiery darts. The evil one is, is obviously it's Satan. And the weapons he described is usually here a typical type of weapons he prefers because he can use it from a distance. You see, he can use people and they're right in front of you. But you see, he orchestrates it from a distance. And it comes in. 
these fiery darts. He can shoot them far off, and they come in quick and without warning. And they can cause great pain and great damage to a person whose shield is not in front. They can be sent one at a time, or they can be sent as a huge number of arrows coming at you. These arrows are also the schemes of the enemy. Remember in Ephesians 6, it says that we can stand against the schemes of the devil. His schemes, his plans, his purposes is to distract you, to dissuade you, to put you aside so you are no longer useful for what God has for you. Again, the five Ds, doubt, distortion, discouragement, distractions, and divisions. And we can include distrust, can come in. And when you allow them to penetrate and get past the door, when you have uh, opened up and you've, you've become more dependent upon yourself than, than that shield, then it can hit and cause great damage. They render you unproductive. We need to remember, again, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And just like the other pieces of armor, this protection is not automatic. It needs to be put on or taken up. Protection is not automatic. You need to put on the belt of truth. You need to put on righteousness. You need to put on and tie up those shoes. And then you need to take up the shield. So what does it mean to take up the shield? He tells us to take up the shield. And when we look back in the Old Testament, we see the shield is actually God himself. And he is able to protect us when as Christians we place our faith, faith in him. And yet somehow these arrows get through. How do we do that? How does that happen? It's because we tend to put more trust in ourselves and our ability to fight. Or we just don't recognize it. We need to come back and remember. Long as the shield is up and we're walking in faith, we don't toss it aside. We keep our faith in Christ. We are protected. The Bible refers to keeping faith in God as living by faith. If we're going to keep this faith up, we live by faith. Let me give you some scripture. It says living by faith or walking by faith or walking in the Spirit. And these, these terms are found in Colossians 2, verse 6, Habakkuk 2, verse 4, Romans 1 and 17. I'm not going to read them all. Galatians 3.11, Ephesians 5 and verse 8, Hebrews 10 and verse 38, and 1 John 1 and 7. How do we live by faith or take up the shield of faith? One definition, and this is what it says, is living by faith is taking God at his word and acting upon it. First of all, taking God at his word, what does God say? And then acting on it. It may seem totally redundant and everything seems so silly to the rest of the world. But you hear what God says and you act on it. I'm going to believe God and we stand in faith. Romans 10 verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How do we grow in our faith? Is to hear God's word and allow God's word to come in. Hebrews 11 and verse 8 says that we read about God, how God told Abram to go on a journey, and Abraham took God at his word, and he acted on it. In verses 24 and 20 to 26, we're reminded to how Moses, in, in Hebrews 11, because Hebrews 11 is all about faith and the different people, Abraham believed God. Moses took God at his word and acted on it. God told him to, to lead the people out. And in verse 30, it says that the following, that, that the same thing about Joshua and, and Rahab and, the, and what the judges did. All these people, they believed God in what he said, and then they acted on it. Go into the promised land. Do you know, in, in, back in Numbers uh, chapter... 
number 40? And I could be wrong. Anyways, in, in Numbers, when they were going to go into the promised land, they sent the 10 spies in. And the 10 spies came back, or, or the 12 spies, sorry, 12 spies went in. 10 were bad, 2 were good. It's all the only way I remember it, you know, right? Uh, it's an old song as kids. 10 were bad, 2 were good. What they sing? And they went in, and some did not put their faith in God. See, we can't. The giants, they're way too big. Joshua and Caleb said, God is faithful. And if we trust God, if we put our faith in God, He will deliver this land. He will deliver the giants into our hands. The naysayers won, and they walked for 40 years in the desert because they didn't take God at His word. 1 Samuel 17, David went, and he was going to fight Goliath. And he came, and this is what it says. It says, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And it goes on, you again, you, he spoke this against Goliath. He says, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord, so that everyone will know that there is a God in Israel. You see, he turned around, he said, This is what... This is how God protected me before, his faithfulness, and God will deliver you into my hand. He didn't trust in his own ability. He trusted in God. Daniel. Shadrach, or Daniel, when he heard the decree, and actually the kids downstairs are hearing about Daniel. They've got the Daniel in the lion's den, and Amy's got that going. But Daniel, there was a decree that went out says you cannot pray to anyone or any God for 30 days. Daniel turned around and he went to his upper room, as he's ever always done, threw open the shutters and prayed. And because of that, he was said, you're going into the lion's den. The king didn't want to do that, but because of deception, now Daniel's got to go in. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 23, after, after uh, Daniel was thrown in, and then uh, Daniel didn't get eaten. We know the story. Daniel didn't get eaten by the lions. In verse 23, it says this, The king gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was brought up from the den, he, found, he was found to be unharmed. And this is what it says, For he trusted in his God. He trusted in his God. That's that faith in Christ. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel chapter 3. They refused to bow down to the idol. So the furnace was, was heated up. And what did it say? It says, but not even if he does, he said this, if the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he can rescue us from the power of you, king, but even if he doesn't rescue us, we want you to know, king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. They refused to bow down, even in the face of being thrown in the fire. And they were. The question that would come down to you and me is how would we respond when the fire is put in front and say, you bow or you burn? Is your faith going to be in God? We're all going to die. It's all right. God is my protector. If I die, I'm saved out of your hand, O king, because God keeps us. But what about the storms for you and me? Just this week, at a meeting, we heard of a lady who lost her two brothers to suicide in eight months. What about her in that storm of life? I got a text this week of Rudy, who's on his deathbed right now, like even closer. They're staying with him day and night now. He's just being pumped with morphine just to keep him. He's dying. What about that storm for that family? And I could go on because I could... I could look and I can see there's been storms in people's lives here. What about you? 
What is the storm that you're facing? Are you putting your trust in God? Do you need the body of Christ to come and link shields with you? To stand firm with you? To pray with you? To encourage you? You see, to, when we put our faith in God together, we can be encouraged one with another. When discouragement or the storms of life happen, how do we take up the shield of faith? Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Proverbs 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. You may not understand it, but trust God. Trust God. When the storms come, be calm. Put on the whole armor of God. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9. And this Peter, he understood. He says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking who he can devour. Satan's looking how he can hit you with an arrow. Be alert. Be sober-minded. Resist him. Firm in the faith, or firm in your faith knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by our fellow believers throughout the world. In Luke, chapter 22, and I can imagine this, and this I, I read this this week, and, and I was just amazed how, how God just brings some of these scriptures. And Jesus looked to Peter. As Jesus, they were, he, he was heading to the cross. And he said this, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, but I've prayed for you. Sometimes that struggle that you're going through, that storm right now, Satan is using to sift you. He's got that arrow and he's hitting your shield and it's exploding in fire. Are you going to throw it away? Or are you going to stand firm? Are you going to trust God? in the midst of the storm. When you and I face storms, we find ourselves overwhelmed with the arrows that are flying. Remember that when we interlock our shields together as a community of believers, we can form a wall of faith which makes the entire church safer and stronger. So let me ask you this morning again, are you facing some storm in your life right now and need someone to stand with you? Let's the church get the shields together and stand together with you. Have you been hit with an arrow of discouragement and despondency? Let me encourage you today. Take up the shield of faith. Put your trust in God. And I know that can be such a bad answer, but it is the answer. Trust in God. That's it. I'm done. But I want to encourage you, and those that are online, if you are needing prayer today, and I know, I, I could just start pointing you out right now, but you know what? I've been there this week. I've had arrows. And I could use prayer. But I know that there's many others here today that you've had arrows shooting and hitting, and you need prayer. You need encouragement today. So if you're there, I'm going to ask that you come and we're going to pray together. And if you're, if you're not getting those arrows at you, then maybe that's a good time to stand because we stand together. You're not getting hit, you pray for those that are facing it. You're facing it, you get somebody else to pray for you. You know how that works? You get it? So I'm going to get the worship team to come up. And if you're needing prayer this morning, I'm going to invite you to come and, 
and we're going to pray. And by the way, I'm one here looking for prayer. So I can in turn pray forever for someone else. So don't think I'm exempt from this. So let's stand together. We're going to sing this last song and then I'm going to invite you to come. Let's just stand up. Everybody just stand. Let's just pray. Father, right now, we just come before you. We recognize, oh God, that the things that are going on around us can be a storm and it can be whistling around us. And Father, we need your help. We need to encourage you. Lord, we need to put our trust in you so that we can stand. And when the arrows come, that, Father, that we recognize where they come and we see them broken in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for each one now that they might not just stand, but Lord, stand back, but, Lord, that they would respond to what you're saying, not just because I said it, but because you are speaking to their hearts. And we commit that before you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Man, so if you need prayer, come up right now. to all.